On today's episode, Yvette and I talk about the importance of deeper conversations. We segue into sporting analogies and talk about table tennis and catching balls. You're going to have to stay right through to the end to work out what we're talking about. And where can they find you, Yvette? Where can people find you? Well, Facebook, if you search for Inner Sea Change, okay. it'll come up with my page. Brilliant. So Inner Sea Change on Facebook. You'll find it. We're going to put it down below. Uh, stay tuned. You'll love it. Hello and welcome to Stories from the Red Couch, episode 76. I'm Robin Cook and today my guest is Yvette Nielsen. Hi Yvette. Hi Robin. Thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. Uh, last year you ran a workshop at, or an event, at the Black Box Theatre in Nambour mm -hmm. and it was around deep conversations. Can you tell me what brings you to be able to hold an event like that, first of all? And then why do you think it's important that we have these deeper conversations? Well, I, I moved back to the coast a few years ago and I worked here about 30 years ago on the newspaper actually, and then moved away, worked in London and whatever, had a few careers. And I came back and didn't really know anyone. So I started going to groups and meetups and events and just couldn't find what I was looking for, which was deeper conversations, you know, not just small talk, chat, you go home and feel like you've had a meal of fairy floss. I wanted the whole three course <laughs> meal. Yeah. And I found that really hard and I thought, well, why can't we have that? You know, um, so I started a group a few years ago and we did that. I'd set a topic and people would talk about it. And I found there are a lot of people who moved to the coast from other places and were in the same boat. And I thought, this could, this could work as a social event, you know, it doesn't have to be a a workshoppy type thing or a groupy thing it could just be an event where you go out and you set the topics and people talk strangers it, it seems contrived though doesn't it, it is to, contrived. to give some topics to, and people really they embrace that they did they did I mean the topics were deep doesn't have to mean dark there were things like sure. you know if money were no concern how would you live differently those sorts of okay. universal questions and it's really just a prompt to help people go deeper um, and in, in between I'd have, you know, information about how we can connect at a deeper level, how to listen better, why we need to, and uh, a few videos and it was a fun night and it seemed to, to resonate and it was actually really, it was a real privilege. As soon as people started talking, we'd pair them up randomly. You know, people, a couple of people were nervous, there were some very introverted people who said they had to use all their strength just to come. Isn't that a wonderful thing? <sighs> Yeah. Because I often live on the very edge of my comfort zone, yep. and I reckon you probably do too. But to, to be so honest about uh, your hesitancy around having those conversations, and yet you still come. That's it. That's the guts. And I mean, that's, that's what it's all about. You, you can't connect at a deeper level unless you're going to risk being vulnerable. Yep. There's no point coming. You know, put your armour up. You can do that anywhere. Yes. This is a chance in a safe space. You know, it was confidential. What's said in the room stays in the room. Um, and it was remarkable. It was just this air of respect and everybody took, the, took up the challenge. Everybody dropped down deep. We had people from 14 to in their seventies and that was lovely seeing different generations talking. So it wasn't Fabulous. just, you know, one age group. And it, it was a, it was a privilege. It was something really special. And people wrote to me or talked to me later and said things like, you know, I had an epiphany that night. I realized why my life is so screwed up. I talk at people, I don't talk with people. Yes. Or, you know, I just, I, in talking to someone, I suddenly realized what I, what I meant. I hadn't heard, thought about it till I actually said it. I've had that experience myself. So I, I for a number of years, I uh, went to a retreat in Toowoomba. And the first time I went, we were sitting uh, in a circle, of course, and we were telling each other about the night prior mm -hmm. to arriving and what I realized in in that and over the course of that weekend was that there is a dialogue that is scripted when we talk to the same people over and over yeah. where I say this and their response is that yes. and then I say that and of course their response is that yep. 
and you never go anywhere you mm -hmm. never progress you never grow well I wasn't in those circumstances is that something that you yeah have totally had that experience totally and and I mean that's the beauty of therapy or counseling which um, you know not everyone wants to do or can do but it is such a gift to be able to have someone in a safe private place where you can experiment with you know being different or um, really talking about things you might not talk to other people who know you and that's the beauty of this night was you're talking to total strangers mm. you've got they've got no preconceived ideas about oh you're this you're a teacher exactly. or you've got yeah, three yeah. kids or you don't work or you know yeah, and you live in this suburb or you're from Noosa you know it was very mm. it's very leveling mm. and it, it, it what it did I think was help people feel like I'm not alone you know other people are scared of debt other people worry when their children leave home other people you know, I feel like a fraud or an imposter. It's just so liberating and refreshing to get rid of all those trappings and masks, drop your masks, just for one night mm. and, and connect. It's a bit like, I heard a podcast the other day, a therapist one, about, it's like pop, ping pong, the difference between ping pong, where you're re replying, yes. re, you know, reply, reply quickly, not thinking the idea is to sort of yeah. get one over the other person. Yeah. And a lot of conversations like that, um, as opposed to catch, where you intentionally want that person to catch your throat. That's a lovely image. And you take your time. Image. And, and you can do that with children. That's a lovely way to encourage conversation between even very young children. Mm. I've just had a couple of weeks with nieces and nephews and great nieces and nephews, which was highlight of this year so far and probably <laughs> will be the whole year. And you can have wonderfully deep conversations with young people. It, it's so surprising because they're original, they, they're not constrained by what I should be saying, what I shouldn't be saying, and they're still developing who they are. They don't have all the layers of the onion. Mm. How about listening? Mm. I'm not real good at that. Are you? <laughs> <laughs> when I have my professional hat on, I'm very good at it. But yeah, I'm a talker probably more than a listener, but I, I think the first step with, with that is to be present. Mm. You know, to, to arrive, to breathe, to ground yourself. Mm and then to really hold back the judgment, hold back on an agenda and just be there and listen, not just with your ears, but with your whole being. Mm. And I think remaining curious, mm. like don't know where the conversation's going to go. Mm. A bit like this. Yeah. Really, because yeah. I have some questions that I wanted to ask you, but I really love the way that you can meander. Oh, I meander. I'm a meanderer. <laughs> So how do you how do you learn how to be a listener? Do you think? Well, I mean, I was trained as a journalist and a, and a counsellor. Okay, but, but is that a different kind of listening to to, to the deeper to conversation? To some extent, but no, and in other ways, not. No, no. I mean, a lot of the tips that I shared at, at my event were similar. <clears throat> Things like, I mean, you've got very prescribed ways to listen. You've got active listening, reflective listening. You know, nonviolent communication. There are many, many different types. But I think. The essence of all of it is to be present and to not interrupt if you can really hold space for someone that is such a sacred gift it's the, the most sacred gift you can give another human being mm. is to really listen to them and hold back on trying to fix them you know we all have a natural helping style yes. and I know I'm a fixer and I'm a, a fixer. you're a fixer you know some people are moralizers some mm. people like to compare some people minimize I hate that um, or, or try to fix you and um, I have, I'm very blessed to have quite a few friends who are happy to just listen and let me be um, and it's hard for them because I've been you know struggling with depression anxiety all my life but particularly the last few years and it must be so frustrating for them to see me spinning my wheels and mm. and they just think she needs to do this 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 and this you know but and how it easy matter. is that I, I mean I certainly fall into that trap I have friends and I think oh if they just did or if I just but you can't do that and so in doing that how do you communicate to the fixer mm or the non-listener, yes. that you still want to maintain a, a closeness with them, but... Yeah, that's always how, tricky. How do you do that? Well, that's sort of why I run the events as well, <laughs> like, is, is, to, is to give people those skills to... to I mean, I, I, I sort of let people know how much I appreciate them being there for me and listening. And I have had friends, that say, friends say that to me, you know, you don't have to fix me a bit. Yes. You don't, and just like that, you don't have to fix me a bit. And I thought, oh, 
Okay. Back off. That's that's nice. She's told me now. I need to just listen and be a friend. She doesn't. It's like counselling. Counselling. It's not the wisdom of the counsellor. It's it's people have their own innate inherent wisdom if they're given the space. So it's in that talking mm. that the other person becomes the mirror. And and like at that that event, you know, you say, oh, I've just said something. Or if you reflect it back, and that's mm. another really good skill. So you reflect back what people say, not in an artificial parenting sort of way, but yes. even that will work. Yes. Even when we're training counsellors, you know, people go, oh my God, you, you, you know, they, you say something and, and you repeat back what the client just said and they go, that's exactly right. And you think, you just said that. <laughs> like, <laughs> they just said that. Yes. It doesn't matter because it's when someone else says it, yes. you hear it as if it's for the first time, that's even right. though it came out of your own head. Sure. So it's giving people that room and young people too, you know, we're, we're very quick to jump in and, and prescribe and want them to not make mistakes and we want to help them, but I know. give them the space and they'll find their own answers and they need boundaries to feel safe in the container and limits to find their own edges, but everybody will find their own wisdom given mm. the space and an empathic, non-judgmental listener mm. it's it's such a gift and, and I, I worry that we're losing the art of listening and the art of conversation how would you um, how would you start a, uh, well I was thinking the other day I was listening to a, uh, a podcast mm -hmm. and we are trained from a young age to not discuss mm -hmm. politics and religion yep and I think that that conversation was around well how do we expect to be informed and educated yeah. citizens if we've been told forever not to discuss those yes. things. Yes. How do we how do we fix that? I'm just being a fixer. Yeah. <laughs> how do we deal with that? That's well, a how, huge question. How can we have a conversation, mm. a respectful conversation yeah. that loses none of the robustness that's needed? Yeah. But conveys what each person is thinking yeah that that's a universal question at the moment you know and certainly the on being project with krista tippett who runs that amazing podcast they've started the civil conversation project which is trying to do just that they actually have a guide you can download with values to guide your conversations fantastic. difficult conversations and and actual steps on how to listen wow and, that's fantastic you know, how to provide hospitality how you know be patient and, and that's exactly what they're trying to do is because they're alarmed by the polarised debates that we're having in the yes. world, the incivility, the increase in road rage. You know, look at the increasing automation. So you see children barking orders at Siri and adults. We're dropping the pleases and thank yous because yes. it's just a robot, it's yes. just a chatbot. And as artificial intelligence and robots become more and more prevalent, which they will, um, it, it, where do humans fit in? And are we going to lose that ability to empathise mm. because they're not really real anyway, you know, mm. and forget that so there's actually human feelings. Yeah, yeah, there's no, they haven't got feelings, they don't care. So it, it is a huge problem and I think we need to be very conscious of it. But as you said, if we don't talk about the things that we don't understand, how will we ever understand the mm. other? And that's the whole notion of empathy, mm. is understanding what it's like to be in another's shoes. And that's where good listening comes in is it's not until you listen to someone and give them that space, respectful, and holding back your judgments, holding back your counter arguments. So really you have to be um, prepared to do that even before you arrive yeah. at that point, don't yeah, you? You do. What happens if you're encountering someone who is uh, less than approachable? Mm. How do you, how would you start a conversation with them? Because how does someone begin to think that way yeah. unless they've had some introduction to it? Yeah, it, it's true and it's, it's difficult. And I, certainly I, I can go head to head with people if I'm not careful and I'll, I'll often walk away. I need to be in a very centered space and not stressed and not tired mm. if I'm going to take on someone, mm. well not take on, but try to engage someone who has very, very different views or very offensive views mm. compared with mine. Um, and, and this is what the Civil Conversation Project, the Listening Project, all these different listening initiatives around the world popping up are trying to do. Invite a stranger to dinner, have a coffee with someone who's completely the opposite of your political mm. persuasion. And it's not about trying to change their minds. No, not trying to change their minds. Just understand where they're from so they can understand where you're coming yes. from and agree to disagree. There's nothing wrong with that, but do it in a civil way 
you know, not in this polarized black and white way. Yes. There's, there's gray in there. And of course there is. And I think that's the challenge. Is so if you're feeling comfortable in your own skin yep. and your own belief system, like when the Jehovah's Witnesses come knocking at the door, which I love, mm. incidentally. Lots of people really find that um, challenging, but I really love it mm -hmm. because I find that who else can you have a robust <laughs> conversation. conversation with about religion than someone who is so solid in their beliefs. That's right. And I, that's what I love about those yeah. conversations. And I love that they don't get, well, the people I've talked to never get, they stay calm. They've obviously I practiced know. this. No matter how rude people are, they manage to keep yes. their cool. And that must take, yes. take well, a bit. Well, I'm never rude with no, them, of course. No. But, but, you know, just toing and froing with the ideas and the concepts. Yeah. And, and I am an atheist and I feel really comfortable with that. Yeah. And, and we, we, we go away, I think, respectful in that, well, this is fabulous, that yeah. this is what you're doing. And, and, and they don't visit anymore, so maybe, <laughs> you know. Uh, but but you're both richer. Yeah, that's right, yeah. absolutely. Absolutely. We need more of that. We need more dialogue and, and less of this shouting down and the hate speech online. Mm. You know, we're, it's very hard to have a measured conversation about these, you know, difficult topics. So I think that's why we need to get in young and start teaching children, you know, empathy well, having and, the, and having those conversations. To and start having with. the children with having so the conversations. So you were yeah. talking before about your nieces and nephews, your great nieces and nephews, and, and that idea of, of throwing the ball and catching them, mm. and that's your time to talk. Mm. It doesn't matter what they come out with. No. It doesn't. It could be fantasy. It doesn't matter. Mm. It's helping them think. It's helping them work out their own values and also hearing how your ideas might be different from theirs. And that's okay. Mm. You know, but they, I find kids just amazing when, when you have time and you give them presents, which they don't always get. That's an aunt's role, I believe, mm. you know, because everybody's so busy these days. And, and we we're talking about technology, you know, and I, I said to the kids, you know, 11 and 12, these two were about what I was doing with the deeper conversation events. I said, what do you think about, should I be doing that with children at school? Should, should children learn these skills and how to have conversations about important things and meaningful topics and not just, you know. And they said, no, adults need it more. <laughs> I thought, you know, you're right. <laughs> They already do it. Yeah, that's funny, given, given it? the space, whether and they often do it. I always found it interesting working with adolescents um, at a refuge in Western Sydney or, or younger people. You, you can't actually have a face-to-face -face intense eye contact sure. conversation with a, with a lot of kids. It's too threatening, it is. particularly if they've had tra trauma upbringings. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, we'd play handball down the corridor, oh, yes. and, and one that, kid that would work. Yeah, wouldn't it? he'd never talked. He d didn't talk the whole session. I said, you know, what do you want to do? Let's get out of here. I said, can we play handball? I thought, what the hell? We just played, and he suddenly started opening up. Yes. Or little kids, you and know. And that's through action yeah. too, isn't it? Often using when your you're hands and engaged, body. your body into yeah um, the activity, then the mind can flow more freely. Totally, and it takes a lot of pressure off people who are, you know, I love intensity, I, I could, I love, the more intense the better, but for a lot of people it's way too much. Sure. And, and that is a good one, I think that's also maybe why crochet and knitting and all of these crafts and hands-on things seem to be coming back. Yes. Because it's getting people off their devices, mm. but it's not quite as threatening as sitting there face to face. You can yeah. be in a group of people all doing your, whatever you're doing. That's right. Or and cooking or gardening. And, um, yeah just comes of that naturally yeah yeah I was uh, also hearing today um, a podcast well a conversation with this fellow whose name just completely escapes me now but he was talking about in the early days of high-rise buildings and lifts and he was saying that there are a lot of complaints from people because they were queuing and they and the lifts were taking so long and so the question was posed is the problem the lifts or is the problem the complaints about the lifts? And so they decided that the problem was the complaints mm. about the lifts because they couldn't actually do anything about the lifts. Yeah. It was a mechanical process. It takes the time it takes. Yeah. So the solution was to put uh, floor to ceiling mirrors mm -hmm. in the lift lobby, which distracted the people. So they stopped complaining. 
And he, he gave numerous examples of using distraction to placate our impatience. Yeah. And that's what phones are now. Yes. Aren't they? They are. They're, they're really a dummy. Yes. You know, to keep us all from not thinking about what is going on in the world mm. with, you know, the planet and politics and mm. automation and society, you know. So Just how do you keep think... earning, stay on the treadmill, don't think, don't yeah, think, consume, 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 and don't think. How do you think we can, because <clears throat> we, I mean, content, online content is everywhere, and we're making it right now. Yep. How do you go about being discerning mm. <clears throat> and curating yeah. your online viewing time? Well, that's, that's, that's a tough one. I mean, my second career is a web content consultant. You know, when the internet was young, I was curating content to show people before Google, hey, here's an interesting site, here's another interesting site. And obviously now there is so much content, yeah. it's overwhelming. So it, it's tricky. I mean, first thing I do when I wake up is check the ABC headlines. And that's, I'm trying to break that habit because often it, it's just all negative. You can't find, it might be one token good news story. Mm. And it is a token story. Yeah. And then on the other <laughs> hand, you go to Facebook feed and you go, oh God, everybody's so happy. It's just too much <laughs> bliss. I can't stand it. I don't, it's like the world's biggest brag book. I thought, yeah. no, if you're feeling depressed at home alone and childless and penniless, you you don't give a stop. You don't want to look yeah, at people's beautiful right. eyes. Because <clears throat> it's going to make you feel worse. It is. And it, it, we need a balance. So people are saying, you know, it, life's tough and you're not alone. I think that's the message that we need to hear. Mm. Um, but there's also good stuff going on in the world and lots of wonderful initiatives and kindnesses. And, and we miss that because of the skewed way it's presented. Mm. So you're right. How do you create it? I mean, I've got a whole list of podcasts and you would too. Newsletters that I read like anything from the school of life love that yes well we were just discovering that weren't we because yeah. i love the school of life yeah emotional intelligence and, uh, and how to live uh, and and i think that there's been some criticism around the uh simplifying of some of those bigger topics topics yeah but what i like about that simplicity is that often the answer is really quite simple and it's a shift and sometimes yeah. those simple keys yeah can just provide the right shift in thinking so that your perspective has changed yes totally to think differently yeah i think so and i love that the school of life also promotes therapy they have therapy in their yeah. headquarters in london so they said that's the greatest thing you can do to change the planet if we all work on our own stuff yeah. rather than trying to change what's out there mm. you know that's the, well, the that's best all investment you can, you can make that's yeah, actually that's all you can do you can't and change anything out. other than change you yourself, change yourself. Yeah. And, and that's um seen as navel gazing or selfish or a waste of time yeah, self-indulgent i don't think it is not at all if it means you're going to be less likely to abuse someone because they cut your foot around about that's right it's a good thing so what have you got coming up this year Whew. um i'd like to just snorkel with my niece and nephews all day long but <laughs> sadly they've gone back to school so i Damn can't that school i know what a nuisance so um i'm thinking about running regular conversation events um, on the coast or further afield. Yes. Maybe do it as a meetup rather than a big social event where I exhaust all my friends. Yes. Setting up. Yes. Um, but similar sort of idea. Um, topics and themes and, and just bring strangers together for a few hours and let them go for it. Mm. I think it's a wonderful idea. Yeah. And I wanted to be at that one in Nambour, but you know, just You're a busy. clash of yeah. events. Yeah, I mean, it's not a unique idea. Certainly the guy who came up with the idea in London, I think he did it in a park okay. and just got people everywhere. It's like the eye gazing movement, you know, that's also trying to get people to connect. It's all about connection and, yes. and we, we don't get enough opportunities to do it. And as you said, we're anaesthetized on these devices and mm. exhausted by it. It's like wonderful, so refreshing to just get back in real time in real world and talk to real humans. Mm. Thank you for that. I've talked too much, haven't I? See, no, I told you, you a bad listener. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, think, I think that we covered a whole we range of interesting ideas and, uh, and just touched on the importance of what it is to have proper, decent conversations and practice our listening skills. Yeah, constantly. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we will be back next week and I hope you will join us then.
He's dying happy. Actually, there's a fly in there. I'm not going to drink that. <laughs> there's a fly in my chamber.